Hi, my name is Carmen, and I'd like to welcome you to the premiere of TV3's Music Monitor. Our show will be bringing you a wide variety of local musical talent, along with lots of surprises. So stay tuned to the most dynamic new musical show to hit your community. Our special guests tonight are the Stingrays. So 
started out being called uh, the Flamingos, but we found out after using that name that it belonged to somebody else. So uh, Bruce and, and Scott sort of uh, had thought of the Stingrays at the first onset when we first had the name, and we decided to change it to the Stingrays right away so we wouldn't get sued by the original Flamingos. And uh, everybody seemed to like the Stingrays better, so we kept that name, and, and that's, that's what we are, that's what we're called. Design, you know, and, and so we've we've kind of tailored our music to being a fast-paced music that's that's very trimmed down and very sleek and, and not uh, you know not garbled up with a lot of you know garbage. You know.
you guys think of the music scene in Detroit as far as bands trying to play their own tunes and uh, make it's, a living in it? It's hard right now. It's real. It's dried up, and uh, the money doesn't seem to be around like it used to. And it's it's really hard to be creative when yeah. it's that tight. Well, do you guys support yourself with just the name? <laughs> <laughs> we try, but uh, support. I wouldn't use that. <laughs> we guys do do a lot of gigs. Well, what kind of uh, future plans have you guys got? Well, we have uh, a 45 call Take You Out Tonight and video, which is uh, going to be doing really well for us pretty soon. Also, we planned on, on moving out of the immediate area and playing some out-of-town dates, doing maybe possibly opening on some concerts. And uh, the, the Detroit scene is just not doing it for us really anymore. You kind of outgrow it after a while, it's, and so it's time to move. And that's what we want to do. Okay, good luck to you guys. Hope to hear more of it. It's gonna creep me for a long time Thank Mr. Frank Pettis and all the members of Metro Cablevision, the staff and the crew here at TV3 for allowing us to be the first band to appear here on Music Monitor.
My name is Jerry Lubin, and this program is called Music Monitor. The specific segment of the program is Inside Tracks. I have a guest with me here tonight. His name is Tom Gilardi. Hi, Jerry. Tom for several years, uh, having been involved in radio myself, I've come in contact with Tom, who is involved in the record business. And uh, basically, Tom is a record promoter. In other words, it's his job to get a record played on the radio stations. Right. It's a hard job sometimes. Very hard. We'll talk. Pepper. But the Beatles had something to do with uh, with changing the whole nature of the uh, record and radio business, didn't they? I think so, because of the dollar volume that the industry finally recognized that you really can't put a label. Prior to that time, as you know, a million sale of a single record was considered, and uh, you know, phenomenal. Uh, we did not know what album product could do. The Beatles changed that. They suddenly were selling 10 million uh, singles in the states and 30 million worldwide, and a million albums started to become. A very obvious uh, their ball game, so it changed the whole feel of the record industry. The I remember that uh, from "I Want to Hold Your Hand" to "Rubber Soul and Revolver." I remember critics saying "I Want to Hold Your Hand" was such a piece of trite, and I remember those same people saying "Rubber, Rubber Soul and Revolver" were classic transitions of great talent that suddenly emerged and began to write great songs. So uh, even those people recognized the Beatles were really a superb talent. And that's still accepted to be the case today. I think it's phenomenal. I have, as you know, three daughters, and to watch them grow up and and learn and get into the Beatles and find other generations accepting this act as probably the definitive group in modern rock is, is amazing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Jerry, they're, they're going to go on for posterity. They are just something very special in music. One of our favorite sons here in town uh, also is uh, part of the uh, Capitol Records and part of, scheme. And part of and, my uh, history. That's Bob Seeger. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with Bob uh, several years ago that, when he was getting started. That was a very interesting thing. I remember when, uh, when he was on A Square and there were uh, East Side, West Side, Persecution Smith. There were a number of hits breaking out of Detroit. Nothing else was happening with Bob. And I approached Capitol and a particular gentleman by the name of Carl Ingleman in Los Angeles. And I said, Carl, we have an act here that is a phenom. There's only one other market, and that's Orlando, Florida, where he gets programmed. But I'd like you to come see him because I think he can be a major talent because he's such a fine writer as well as a performer. He did fly in, and Punch Andrews at that time, as you mentioned to me, had a club on Northwestern Highway. Something different. And we showcased him in the afternoon that day, and I'll never forget when we finished watching him, Carl and I went back to the dressing room after Bob had uh, dried up and, and changed, and we were sitting there, and I'll never forget the one thing about Bob Seeger that has remained steady and constant was he as, was as quiet and laid back as anybody that I think I ever knew that I thought was that genuinely talented. And I must say till today, Bob Seeger, as you know, has never changed as a man. And Capital signed him, and the rest, as you know, over the last 12 years has been a worldwide talent has evolved. One of the uh, one of the great ones, sure. One of the fine writers in popular music today. No it's question. been uh, quite erratic for him too, though. Uh, those uh, albums for uh, Capitol, uh, with the exception of maybe the Ramblin' Gamblin' Man, didn't all sell no, real well. No, they did not. And, and, uh, and there were switch some, labels. Yeah, and then the Warner Brothers situation and and the involvement through there, uh, and it was a good period and a bad period, I guess, there for a while. And then Punch again came back to Capitol and said, "Let's put it back together." And I think from the return to Capitol, as you said, the rise continued until we've gotten to the picture where he's now accepted as a worldwide talent. The, uh, we were talking about the Beatles and the, the transition that they helped to bring about, and uh, one of the ways I look upon this is uh, the move from singles to albums as the dominant marketing tool of the uh, record industry. And uh, I'm curious as to how your techniques as a promotion man were uh, affected by this change. It was affected dramatically because you're right. We had always had the single as an exploitation uh, vehicle, and that was the only way we attempted to get play, even though there, were, there generally was an album in the background. The Beatles, as soon as they released an album, our problem was uh, with so many cuts were being played at one time, it, it, it opened our eyes to the fact that you don't have to go to a station with a 45. If you have an album good enough, generally they'll find two or three cuts and program it in that light, and that's what's happened, as you know, in the so-called FM or AOR ballgame. When you have a hit album, you usually have meat and potatoes, two or three cuts they're using at any given time. So it's totally changed that. The single record still remains a, a vital vehicle for country, black, and good music, but it does not have the effect at uh, rock level that it had in the early stages. The Beatles changed all that. Is, is that, um, do you feel that will stay? I don't think there's any question. We'll, I don't think we'll ever go back and see the single record as a vital vehicle unless there's an album in the wings, and if that's true, that cut will only lead to a couple of more cuts being programmed. Some uh, have said that uh, as the radio station's programming gets tighter and tighter, that uh, ultimately it might lead to the resurgence of the single. But uh... I don't think so, Jerry. I think that uh, as tough as it is, and I realize that a lot of FMs do not play a lot of music, I still think the acts that will break through will break through because of a unique situation of one tune, but there will be things behind them in those albums that are 
quality enough that someone's going to say it is not a one act or one tune act, they are definitely going to be here. Tommy, you said that uh, about the time the Beatles stopped happening was when you left Capitol Records. Right. And, and is that when you became an independent promotion? I went on my own in 70, in, uh, in March, April 1st of 70, Jerry. Yes. Well, that was uh, taking a big chance, was it not? A very big chance, because obviously I was doing very well with a very successful company. But I had had a lot of people say to me, you must understand something when you work for a company in a particular area, in that you're representing them for whatever period of time. I was with them 13 years. People said, you really are the label for this market. We feel you're having that enough contacts and you're strong enough to go out on your own. I felt I had to challenge myself that way, Jerry. And you know as well as I do, if you can do your own thing and you're able to make a living at it, it is always a much more gratifying situation. Frankly, for me, it's been a blessing because I feel I challenge myself every day this way. All right. There's a band or an artist. They make a record and the company puts this record in your hand. Right. And then it's up to you to take it to a radio station or stations right. and somehow influence the people at that station to play the record on the radio. Right. And what can you do that somebody else can't do to get that record played? I think the only thing I do that is, uh, that is uniquely different, if anything is different, about why there are independent promotion reps in the market is that I'm much more consistent. I have a great deal more credibility, I feel, because I've been here a lot longer. And I do not, as you know, because you know me well enough, you don't tell tales and you don't lie and you tell people exactly like it is because you've got to call on them every week. And I think that those are the things, that consistency that I've involved. As you know, I make the state of Michigan. I've made it as a general rule in a six-week cycle for over 20 years. People can set their clocks but knowing I'm going to be there on that particular day. Guys will say to me that I talk to, you are coming next Tuesday, right? And I say, yeah, it is next Tuesday. I think those are the things that have caused it, Jerry, where I get some situations where I get things programmed and maybe get chances and things exposed that other people don't. And I think enough of that has happened and enough, enough of that has gone on to be hit records. That's what been, it's been built on. I think it's still built on the man and his situations. There are a lot of bands. I go to as many clubs and uh, concerts as I possibly can. And uh, I'm finding that I enjoy myself more going to see bands from town than uh, to see I the agree. national groups. I agree. I think, we have, I think we have so much fine talent in all phases of music, be it country, be it jazz, be it rock. We have always, this market has always been a great inspiration for young talent. It's just a question, as you say, they're somewhat stifled right now, and we hope we can change that. I agree wholeheartedly. Tommy, thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. It's wonderful. This is uh, Inside Tracks. Thank you very much.